and welcome everybody to another bangers and classics podcast um it's with me uh james ruppert and him david malloy and uh what's david uh, been doing recently anything oh well not uh, ducking and diving bobbing and weaving that kind of thing james yep. and doing more work in the bangers and classics ev and cleaning up some more of the filth that was in it um good we'll, we'll get into that uh got some news though yeah the Renault 1916 valve that we've been talking about, over, well, I've been talking about over mm. the last couple of weeks, it sold at auction last weekend yep. for £8,775, I believe, including BIOS premium. Goodness me. That's quite, you know, that shows they're creeping up in value as well. Mind you, there are so few good ones left, that's bound to happen. Yeah. Either that would just disappear completely. Well, that, that's that right. would That would be a shame. It would be. Yeah. But I saw something interesting on the roads. Tell yep. they had to go up to uh, a place called Largs, and the first car I saw was an unidentified US barge. I uh, just saw the you know the tail end of it. Um, you know, it was about forty feet long. You know, weighed about six six tons or whatever. You know, taking up most of the road. I just couldn't with a visual fix on it. I just saw a flicker of it, and it was gone around behind a wall. Um, but it was huge. But I did see another American car uh, later in the day on the same road. And this one was in pristine condition, and it was being driven. Can you guess what it was, James? It's not a popular car. Or it's not wasn't. a car. Um, for some reasons, yeah, for certain reasons. Car oh, from the uh, 60s. A car from the 60s. Um, uh, uh, would it be Ralph Nader's favourite car? That... It was Ralph Nader's favourite car. Really? It. Well done, sir. It was a Chevrolet Corvair. Yeah. And I have to say, this one looked absolutely spectacular. Really good, Nick. Again, going the opposite direction, didn't get a chance to even get a really good you know, close look at it, but what I saw, um, the car just looked as if it had rolled out the showroom. It was perfect. And I'm nothing against the Corvair. I mean, the swing axle suspension wasn't good, but it was nothing like as bad as uh, Nader claimed it was. No, it um, wasn't. No, no. No, no, not at all. And actually, no, they are actually pretty good cars. My uh, good friend uh, Richard Bremner has one. Um, he went to the States and bought one a few years ago. I, I believe he still got it. I don't know. Right. Um, but it, but they are pretty, pretty good cars, and uh, yeah, they were. I mean, quite unusual for the time mm. because obviously the engine was in the wrong place. But yeah, yeah. But again, it's a Volkswagen Beetle influence, obviously. It is, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's an, it was a nice looking example, and I don't mind the Corvair at all. It did something different, and yeah, you know, it actually looks quite good when you see it. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so styling has stood the test of time. Mm. Uh, I did see that. Only other thing I saw of note. Was and I seem to have mentioned this before was a an early XL in blue, which seems to live in the village next door. Um, saw it in someone's driveway, um, and it looks like a nineteen eighty three one. So it could be an XL Eclat oh, or an right. Eclat XL rather, mm. um, rather than an XL. Um, I didn't bother to take down the number and actually look it up and see if it, if it was one of the very early ones. The the early XLs, James, were mm. um, Eclat XLs, I believe, and then obviously it just became the XL. Yeah. Um, and they changed a bit over the years. I think they became less attractive over the years, personally. I think, you know, as yeah, no, I would uh, agree with you there. Wasn't there something online that there's uh, um, uh, uh, an elite or an XL which has been pulled from a swamp in Florida and it's going to be restored or something? So, uh, right. I don't know if you saw a picture of that at all. No, I haven't. No, oh, right. Yeah, I thought maybe you'd bought it and you were shipping it back, but you know. I've bought enough clunkers lately, James. Yeah. <laughs> and unwittingly bought enough clunkers without worrying about it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, certainly enough dirty vehicles, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, anyway, what have you seen? What have you been up to? Um, well, uh, strangely enough, um, the uh, A47 um, was uh, uh, blocked this week, uh, which uh, is a major road. It's basically the motorway road uh, in Norfolkshire. Right. Uh, because there are no motorways in Norfolk. I don't know if I've ever told this story, but I actually went on a uh, on a day out uh, from Norfolk to the M11 and M25 uh, once. Um, I actually did a, a story on it because people were so uh, intrigued by the by the fact of motorways because they don't exist where I live um, that they would they organised coach trip that ran for about two years, so you could actually get on a coach trip and uh, uh, you you stopped at the um, uh airports because there were no motorway services in those days on the on the uh, new m25 you would stop at gatwick you would stop at heathrow and you would stop at stansted on the way down so that just gives you an insight into the uh, mindset of the, the people in norfolk who would uh, uh, get on to uh, uh, a day out coach in, in order to uh, travel around the m25 very long day very boring day 
Um, so that was that. So that's a, a long way of explaining the A47 is a very important road. Um, and that makes the little tiny roads, uh, which are you know, barely sea roads where I live, very, very busy um, because uh, apparently there was a, uh, a lorry had tipped its load. Uh, that meant uh, we had a very, very busy uh, number of cars. So for about most of the day, it was constant trucks and uh, cars going past. And you'd think, well, that's going to throw up some interesting things. No. Uh, all I saw was uh, a, a 2CV going for it, uh, a 2CV uh, almost on two wheels uh, going um, uh, round the corner and uh, having a good time. So uh, that was a bit wasted, but never mind, uh, you, amongst all the trucks. Well, you asked when our colleague Steve Cropley had the 2CV turbo in the 80s, remember? Yes, he did. And uh, it uh, yeah caught a light, didn't it? They caught a light, but they did rebuild it. Yes. Um, and it still exists. I believe it's needing some work done, but it's still there somewhere. Yeah. It's still out there. I looked into it. I did actually uh, contact Steve on Twitter. And he didn't, <laughs> got no reply. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, thanks, Steve. If you're listening to this, uh, <laughs> cheer, cheer, cheers, mate. It was a genuine question. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, he bought a Lotus Elan yeah. M100 recently, so I can't slag him off too much. No. If there's any questions, I can post them on. <laughs> No, my, no, no. My close personal friends in the world of uh, motor journalism. <laughs> uh, yes, I have no, uh, I have no close personal friends anywhere. No, well, <laughs> yeah. well, well strangely enough, I, I mean, old Steve um, was very, very good uh, to me because uh, I wouldn't be right, I wouldn't have written for Car Magazine if he hadn't have said, "Yeah, go on, mate, uh, write me stuff." So I, I had no background in anything, and uh, he just said, "Yeah, write about used cars," because I said I could, and I did. And there you go. So it's the sort of thing that I don't think happens anymore. Um, you probably have to have a thousand Twitter followers or something and um, have somebody who, uh, I don't know, you have to work free somewhere as an intern for three years or something. I don't know. But uh, mm. yeah, in the old days, in the 80s, uh, you could uh, ask for something and the people go, yeah, go on, have a go. So uh, yeah, Steve's OK. Yeah. But, you know, he's seen through you, uh, David, I should think. He's seen through your ruse and uh, he's decided <laughs> to ignore you for some reason. But no, in, in real life, he's a very nice chap. But I'm sure um, I'm sure it was a, just a mistake, an oversight on his part. Oh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm used to being overlooked, James. I wouldn't worry. Oh, really? oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you're six foot three. It's very, yeah, hard, six to, foot... very hard to overlook. Oh, well, maybe they just see through me then. Maybe I'm just yeah. invisible. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't worry about it. I just, you know I me, mean? I just do my own thing, dance to my own beat. In, insofar as I'm not banned from dancing these days. No. Well, strangely enough, actually, on a uh, on a car note, uh, which you may want to include, David, I don't know. But no, I got, I, I, got I did I did get an email from uh, a reader, which was like an emergency one. It's like, I'm going to see a car tomorrow, and I've got to drive, you know, two and a half hours to go and see it. Should I buy it? You know, it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, my days. You know, I can't, oh, I can't do that. I can't, you know, you can't put all that responsibility on me. Um, but he did give me some details. It was a 2018 Mondeo. Um, it was uh, very low priced. Um, it, um, I think it was about 11 grand or something. And uh, But it was a category car. It was a category S car. So my word to him was uh, be extremely careful. I personally wouldn't uh, do it. Um, unless you're going to keep the car running into the ground. I've got a mate of mine who's a plumber. And he buys written off vans and then fixes them and then runs them into the ground. And yeah, you can see the, the point in that he buys, you know, they, he gets very, very cheap stuff. But um, what I subsequently found out is that, yeah, he did take my advice. So that was great. So I was pleased he didn't do that. But he was thinking he was thinking we, he's actually waiting for uh, a focus to come through the dealer system. because He's going to wait a few months um, because there are delays on cars, brand new cars at the moment. So this yeah. was uh, marked well done on price, but he was thinking, yeah, what I'll do is I'll flip it, uh, you know, after, you know, using it for two, three months. And so this is like a, a, a warning to people is, is that, um, yeah, car dealing is best left to car dealers, really. I mean, you might get lucky. I mean, you know, sometimes it can happen. You can buy a car, run it for a bit and you get your money back or get more than your money back. But uh, with that amount of money. Um, I was sure you would do the same as me, David. If I was waiting for a car, I'd just buy something for a thousand quid or something. Uh, I really wouldn't spend eleven thousand and then think, yeah, I'm going to easily sell that because as soon as you see category on a car, you just go, well, no, I need to know an awful lot more about it. Uh, there's mm. nothing wrong wrong in doing it, um, and certainly on the lower 
categories, um, you know, that you know, some of the damage is extremely minor, um, and you can get 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 away with it, and you can get it taken off the register as well. But uh, it, you know, it just requires a bit of effort, and actually, most most of the times, it's best not to. But uh, yeah. I don't know what you think on that, Dave. Um, I bought a category C uh, Z4 mm. once, yeah. and I did see the photograph, so I saw the damage to it, which yeah. was it was unbelievably minor. Mm. It was ridiculous, and. It was a bit, it's a really good car. It's very reliable. Took it in to get serviced, and the BMW specialist said it's a long time since we saw one as clean as that. Really, you know, on the underside, mm. etc. So, yeah, you can buy you can yeah. get a good deal uh, buying a category car, but you have to be ever so careful, and you have to yeah. really know what the damage is. Um, as it turned out, the guy um, who had damaged it, his father ran a body shop, mm. and they fixed it, but they took photographs showing the damage, showing the repair, and it was literally. There was nothing under the skin. It was just a nose cone, um, front. Um, I think it was a head. I think it was a near side headlight, mm. and that was about it. It was yeah. a couple of panels needed to be replaced plus the headlight, and that was it. And the category seed it for that, yeah, because there was nothing else wrong with that car. And by the time, obviously, I got it, it had been repaired. Uh, it was a lovely car, and I remember selling it. And the chap came up to see it. Came a long way to see it. And he said, I was going to try and bid you down, but having seen the car, I'm not even going to bother. This, this, is, this is wonderful. Yeah. And it really was. It's just, unfortunately, it didn't really suit my particular needs at the time um, when I sold it. So, um, But when I bought it, it did, yeah, obviously. But, yeah, it was a, you know, you can get a good car doing it. Because I bought one later on, a Z, another Z4 that wasn't a cat car, and it was terrible. Sometimes it's your Donald Duck, as the saying goes, yeah, of is. what you get. Mm. But if you, if you do your homework, do your research, and try and find out what the damage was and what repairs were done, talk to people, you can get a good bargain. Yeah. Um, it just depends. But um, you've got to be very sensible about it. Anyway, mm. and on that note, we will take a very quick break. You're listening to Bangers and Classics, the podcast at the end of the universe, or possibly even a bit fuller. Uh, so welcome back. And um, we're going to deal with this week's banger or classic. And, uh, you know, we've gone back to a British car for this week. It's the Princess. I don't know. Does Mr. Ruppert want to start this one or shall I start it? Well, I don't know, David. I mean, I, d- I did have one and uh, they're bangers. That's it. And uh, <laughs> You had a princess? So what do we, yeah, for a very, very short uh, yeah. period of time. Oh, I and think you told me about that, yeah. And they're bangers, and they do, and it did end up, strangely enough, I know everybody hates banger racing, but that's that's where it went. So I actually sold it to someone to, who, that's what they were going to do with it, because uh, they they found right. the front-wheel drive packaging of it um, quite good, because you can get smashed up the rear, and it'll still keep going. So uh, there you go. It was an yeah. extremely average, uh, dreadful car. And, yeah. Uh, you see, I don't know if I would entirely mm. go along with that. Mm. Um I th- it was a very much a flawed car, I think. Mm, and yeah. it really, I mean, the first thing they got wrong was um, they decided that Harris Mann's original styling proposal to have a hatchback, oh, that wasn't suitable for a car of that class. And mm. besides, it might compete with the Maxi. Well, the yeah. Maxi looked old when it was introduced. <laughs> what were they thinking of? This, the, the Princess looked like it should be a hatchback, and eventually it became one in the form of the Ambassador. It did, that's but right. But it wasn't a hatchback, so that was the... The first thing they got wrong, when I was doing some research about the Princess James, I came yeah. across a name that I'd never heard of, and I, I've just got to repeat it here. It, it's such a great name, and it sounds like a name of a sort of B movie actor, but he wasn't. He is Filmer Paradise. How about that? Filmer Paradise was a real person. Goodness me! Yeah, he was uh, heavily involved in sales at BL, and I think he was with Ford uh, and other people before that. Uh, it was an American chap. And he was around at the gestation of the princess, though I think he moved on quite wisely, probably, uh, before it came a reality. Digression there, to, to, talking about Filmer. Back to the princess. One of the other problems, apart from the fact it wasn't a hatchback, was it was originally launched in three separate fl- flavours. Mm, you yeah. could have it as an Austin, a Morris, or a Woolsey. And they lumbered it with probably two engines that weren't great. The 1.8 B-series which was quite an old engine at that point, and the 2.2 E-series, which was smooth, but it lacked power and had poor fuel economy. And, of course, this was not that long after the global energy crisis, and people were still a bit wary of buying cars that consumed a lot of fuel. It got worse for the Princess, because then along came you know, British Leyland's financial woes and the Ryder Report, and they decided that instead of marking the Princess as an Austin, a Morris, and a Woolsey, we'll market it as a new mark, Princess. This is six months after they launched the blooming thing, 
So how to confuse the public straight away? We launch it with three different names, and then we combine them into one six months later. So they did that. Unfortunately, it had the same engines, it had the same indifferent build quality, and there was still no hatchback. Um, if you wanted the hatchback princess, you could get one. If you went to, I think Crayford did one, and I know Tora Cars of Devon did one. Um, and also, I think Triplex did the, uh, I think it was called the 1020. It was a glassback, a sort of shooting brake version, which I think looked really good. Mm. But, um, you know, completely ignored by BL, uh, as, as they will want to do. Then you go to 1978, and they bring out the Princess 2. And, yeah, they get rid of the old Rattley B-Series engine, uh, replace it with a nice modern, um, in fact, they replaced it with two engines, the 1.7 and the 2.0-litre O-Series. But they still didn't give it a hatch. It was crazy when you think yeah, about well, it. Yeah, it did have very nice, uh, squishy velour seats, though, on our if I remember it, they were very mm. comfortable when you were broken mm. down. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It, it was a roomy car. It was a Ooh. comfortable car. It didn't drive too badly, really. Uh, when you, you know, all things considered, it, it was a bit of a barge, but it was a comfortable, um, quite appealing barge. I think some of the detailing, you know, basically they made a mess of that from the, from some of the prototypes you see to the production versions that they could have tidied that up and tidied up the wheels and it could have been quite a striking car. You know, it really it wasn't much wrong with the styling of it. I don't think there was for the day anyway. It was very much of its time. It was a wedge shape. And, you know, it, some of the Harris Mann hallmarks in it, um, which you may or may not like. It depends on your views. But I think it looked okay. But they still struggled on without hatchback from another three years and then ditched the princess name, brought out the Austin Ambassador. But it was clearly a princess with a hatchback. And that was the end of the 2.2 litre engine. And it was, but it was far too late. I mean, this was six years after, or seven years after the car had been launched. There's no point in doing that, really. And the ambassador struggled on, I think, to 84, and they sold only, what, 40, 43,000 or so. Never made it in left-hand drive, which didn't exactly help. And that was it. So you had a car that I think could have been a good car if it had been better built, if they paid a bit more attention to what the public actually wanted. Just a little bit more care and attention all around. That could, they could have had a good product, James. Maybe you disagree. No, I think you're right. Yeah, it's it's again with all of the um, uh, BL stuff from that era. Uh, if they'd have concentrated a bit more, um, it could have been a very different uh, story. And uh, yeah, it would have been a lot better than. Uh, I mean, Cortinas of the time again were just really sort of quite dreary cars, but they were they were reliable, um, and that's what people wanted. Um, and yeah, they were. And uh, and they didn't look odd either. So yeah, if you wanted something exotic, you bought a Lance series, bought an Alpha or something. Um, yeah. But yeah. really, yeah, there was there was just nothing nothing there, and they sort of abused people's patriotism. A lot of people would buy a car because it was British, and actually, mm. it's a bit like the Wolsey thing. You think to yourself, what on earth were they doing Wolseys? But I think there was um, customer feedback where there were enough. There was enough of a loyalty to the Wolsey brand to actually justify. Um, you know, selling. You know, they would they would still sell a certain amount a year, and they could sell it at, at, at a premium. Well, at least that's what their dealers told told them. But on reflection, it just looks like a waste of time and money, really. It was, yeah. I mean, when you, as I say, within six months, the whole project had changed. Um, from, you know, from a three pronged approach to you know being condensed into a single brand, it just it made li very little sense, if any, to me. In spite of this, I, I'm, I'm going to say it's not a banger because it gets so much stick the princess and it wasn't such a bad car. It could have been a good car. I can't honestly say it's a classic either. I'm going to put it somewhere in the middle ground, except I'm going to say the Triplex 1020 is definitely a classic, but they only made one of those, as far as I know. Um, so I wouldn't go as far as to call it a banger because I actually quite like it. Uh, I always sort of have liked it. Two words always come to mind. When you think of British Leyland, it seems those words are wasted an opportunity. And this is another one. Um, it should have been so much more. It could have been a great car. And instead, it uh, became a butt of many a joke, rather like the Marina and Allegro. And it's, it's, it's tragic in its implications, really. But uh, there we go. So, uh, what do you think, James? You're still going to stick with Banger? I will stick with Banger just to be the opposite to you, David, really. <laughs> That's all. I mean, you know. uh, well, I expect that from you. I expect uh, no yeah. I expect no less, really. Loyalty, that great loyalty there from. Uh, oh, loyalty! I don't even know what that is. Yeah, you know, you have to you have to spell it. I mean, someone told me the other day that gullible wasn't in the dictionary, and I believed him. Really? 
But no. they, 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 there again, David, maybe we should we should rebrand the podcast as the Ambassador Podcast. That'd be quite good, isn't it? <laughs> Or the print the well the princess podcast but that might because, mean we we have to talk about certain things I don't yeah know. um the only problem with calling the podcast ambassador would be that people would think we were going to give them free free or chase and i'm not sure that the bangers and classics budget would run to that anyway on that note let's take a short break this is bangers and classics the official podcast of 1977 Right, so we're, we're back now, and we're going to do this week's challenge, which was, James, to find uh, a post, or sorry, a pre-1996 Super Mini for 2500 wasn't it? Well, it could have been, David, but the uh, email that I got from uh, the person in charge uh, said it was going to be the best prototype ah. uh, that we um, uh, ever came across. So oh, right. She, the person in charge, she sent me a different email, obviously. She. Oh. I'll, I'll blame her, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I told you before in this program, we don't work to a script. We have no idea what we're doing. Oh, well, that, that much is obvious, obviously, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you tell me about the, or you tell the listeners, James, about the best prototype, and I'll tell you what I found. Right. Well, I mean, in these difficult times, what I always find myself going back to is my uh, automobile yearbook, uh, published in Switzerland um, in 1982. Because as you know, David, I live in 1982 mostly. And um, there used to be a bookshop uh, in Tottenham Court Road called Booksmith, and they sold you know books that cost like you know hundred quid for four ninety nine. Yeah, the bargain bookshop. This was, I paid four ninety nine for this in nineteen eighty something, and it's fabulous. And you should get get these, David, because the motorsport coverage is phenomenal. The pictures in them are brilliant. Uh, they've got period adverts, so you've got people smoking, you've got watches in there that, you know, look ridiculous. It's just brilliant. Um, and also it tells you about the concept cars from that particular year. And uh, I got terribly excited um, in that Giugiaro, um had something called the Orca, which was based on the Lancia Delta. Um, mm. and, all the four, and you think, wow, well, that'd be good, won't it? And you see a picture of the interior. The interior is just amazing. I mean, you look at cars now and you know i don't know futuristic interiors i know they've got a couple of ipads uh, stuck to them but th this just looks brilliant and he's got it's thousands of buttons on the uh, steering wheel and pods everywhere it's brilliant um and then you look at uh, what they did uh, to uh, the poor lancia and uh, old jajara maybe you know he, he was a bit busy that week and so what it looks to me like is is a bit like a not very good uh, Citroen BX so it, it, it looks extremely disappointing it looks very dull indeed so I got all excited about that and I thought well David won't have heard of that and it's you know it's got a drag coefficient of uh, 0 0.245 and it's brilliant but if you looked at it um, so if you google it and have a look at it it's actually quite dreary on the outside or yeah. it's interesting on the inside um, but so the one I went for so on the on the opposite part, part of the color plates uh, on the pages uh, there was it was called uh, the Gear Quicksilver, um, and that. Had oh, a I know about that. Yeah, yeah, and that doesn't that look just unbelievable? You just think, wow, mm. and that could have been a Lincoln. So you, you just think that well, American cars could have actually looked really good. Uh, mm. So uh, yeah, it, it looks like a you know a really good CX. Uh, Do you know it was under the skin though. Um, well, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, well, it, didn't it have the, um, it used a Ford V6. Um, I don't know whether it was just a, a basic Lincoln under the No, it wasn't a Lincoln at all. It was no. actually British under the skin. Oh, the, right. sh the chassis was, I think, a stretched version of an EC 3000 ME chassis. Oh, yes, that's, that's written down here, actually. Yeah. Um, they they go on about the engine being an AC three thousand ME, but they don't they don't say that uh, no, they, the the chassis has been stretched to no, to infinity basically, could, isn't it? Too. I could probably even tell you what one I could find out which one I've got. Uh, mm. I've got yeah, I've got some details of all the AC three thousand built, what became of them, mm. and yeah, it wasn't quite as good a car as the AC Gear three thousand ME from mm. nineteen eighty one. Mm. which they should have built it if you haven't seen it for people go and look at this this is absolutely awesome it's it's what the ac3000 should have been um and i think steve cropley i think we're back back to steve cropley again oh, it's the steve cropley show this week yeah it is yeah we should he's 
well, I think Steve, if memory serves me right, I'll, I'll check this before this goes out, obviously. And if I'm wrong, I'll delete it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd expect no less. Um, I think Steve tested this in 1981. Oh, right. Um, and I'm pretty sure he came, he ran out of superlatives mm. during it. It still exists to this day. I think the Quicksilver does as well. Yeah. The Quicksilver wasn't intended for production, but you're right, James, it's an mm. absolutely brilliant car. Yeah, it but, is. But the AC gear, um, mm. or the, 3000 ME came quite close to production. Ford considered it at one stage. AC didn't have the resources to do it himself by that no. stage for reasons I won't go into just now, but um, yeah. And go back to the Lancia Orca. It kind of reminds me of a cross between a Toyota Corolla, mm. a Chrysler Alpine, and a Citroen ZX on the mm. outside. Yeah, you're probably right. Z- yeah. ZX more than BX. Yeah, yeah. It's, mm. it's something similar to that. But yeah, the instrument panel looks great, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Fantastic, though. It's- yeah, I, I kind of like that myself. I'll, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what was he? He was probably did the rest of it on his lunch break or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's your one, James. You have two prototypes, the Lancia Orca and the, the Quicksilver, which you should say could have been a Lincoln. Um, mm. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit of British in it as well. Well, the email to me said I was to find a Super Mini. Oh, right. Uh, from pre-96 Super Mini that cost under two and a half grand. Right. And I looked, well, I thought, okay, 205G, two, I'm going to go 205 GTI for that kind of money. Yeah. What kind of 205 would I get? The answer is, uh, I wouldn't really get very much at all. So, <laughs> okay, Renault 5, that's a good car. And the ones I found needed a lot of work. Um, still a couple of semi-decent ones, but there's so much work. No. Then I thought, let's look for a Clio. Can't, of course, you're not going to get a Clio 16 foul, but I did find one I did like. I'd check this out. It's on eBay. And it's a Renault Clio RT. It's a Phase 2, 1.4 RT. It's an M registration. It's bluey-gray color. I don't know the I can't remember the exact name. It's a five-door, 51,000 miles. Quite a few. No, not too many owners, from what I'm told. And in the last year, it's had a new timing belt, water pump, other belts, new pads and discs. The owner called them rotors, by the way. That's what I was going to get at earlier. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. The discs are not rotors. We're not in America, sir. No. Nice car, though. Um, we have wheel bearings, we have wheel cylinders, presumably for the drums, front tires, and your front wheel bearing, engine oil, and filter. And the MOT history doesn't look too bad at all. Nothing, you know, the usual sort of nonsense that comes up in older cars, but you know, brakes, uh, pipes, etc. Nothing really outrageous. Um, it looks very good inside and out. And there's a couple of issues with it leaky sunroof. Well, they all do that, don't they? And heater matrix, probably, I think, reading between the lines needs replaced. Um, only got a short MOT as well, but how much do you think this costs? This this is a nice looking car. Well, I, yeah, because it's not you know it's a it's not a, a fast one. I, I would have thought maybe someone's thinking, well, I'll get you know sort of uh, six seven hundred quid for it. No, it's fourteen hundred quid. Oh, that's all right. But, I mean, I think that's. I'll go trade there. You see. Ah, you're going trade. That's it. Yeah, trade. trade mode. Yeah, yeah. Trade, mate. Yeah, I've tried, yeah. Oh, for all it's worth, mate, yeah. I'm cutting my arm off at that, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, 1400 quid, I think that's actually yeah, a very a very decent yeah, it's price. Right. It's okay. Um, and, you know, I'd almost be tempted myself, but I'm, as soon as I sat in there, I think, I wish it was a 16 valve. Yeah. Just, that's just me, but they're really worthy little cars. Do you know the girl that played Nicole in the Clio adverts? Not personally, no. No, well, yeah. I thought you would, James. You're so well connected. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, how I, old think, I think Steve Cropley does. Though. He probably does. He yeah, he probably does. Yeah. Probably does. Yeah. Or Richard Bremner, one of these guys is bound yeah. to. Um, yeah, well, cheers. It's going to make you feel old. She's yeah. 50. Guy who played Papa, we're about 83 or 84 now. Goodness me. He, that's yeah. what I thought. Well, watch to that effect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Cripes. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit, isn't it? The original advert, I think, was 91 or so, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, so the Clio came out then. Mm. I actually never had, never owned a Clio. I did mm. a look at a 16 valve once. I struggled to get comfortable in it. Take a final break here and we'll come back with some other nonsense. You're listening to Bangers and Classics, the podcast with more filler than a 1977 Maxi. So for the last segment of this uh, some, somewhat disjointed podcast this week, uh, we're going to talk about pony and muscle cars and, you know, Basically, what I want to know, and I think what everybody wants to know is, James, what's your favourite pony and muscle car? What's your favourite and why? Well, David, um, as you know, I have the uh, finest uh, collection of uh, automotive pornography known to man. and Just uh, automotive? 
It's just automotive. Yeah, okay, I, it's one to check. Yeah. yeah, I haven't got enough room on my shelves for anything else. Right. And uh, I have the standard guide to American muscle cars. Uh, sub, the subtitle is a supercar source book, 1949 to 1992. And um, oddly enough, it, it does say the words and photographs inside can help you become an expert on muscle cars and muscle trucks. So I've got this. I mean, it is basically you can open it on any page whatsoever and pretty much everything on it is just absolutely fabulous. You just think, wow, being able to, you know, in the 60s uh, and 70s, especially to buy these cars brand new, you know, to go and spec one up at a dealer must have been absolutely amazing to do. And obviously the, the prices uh, were relatively reasonable, um, you know, for the price of a, uh, a princess, you can get yourself, you know, a, a Chevrolet Chevelle or something. So mm. there's all these uh, amazing cars in there. But what stood out for me, I mean, there are all sorts that have uh, wings and logos and all sorts of things on them. But actually, it's there, there is one sort of real pure breed here, uh, which is the 1963 Pontiac Super Duty Catalina 421, uh, which you could only buy um, if you had uh, some sort of racing reputation and the reason was this with this, this was lightened by 200 pounds so never mind the special engine with all bits and bobs in it so that it could actually do 170 miles an hour which is quite incredible and mm. it did win uh, it did win daytona um obviously in race form uh but it had, had aluminium panels plexiglass and so everything to make it uh, uh you know really uh go fast but the main thing is it's a uh, it's just a mean looking plain car. So it's, you know, it's running on black steel wheels um, and there's nothing fancy about it. Okay. There's a, uh, an air bulge on the uh, roof, uh, but apart on the roof, uh, on the hood, uh, I should say. Um, but uh, yeah, it just looks the part. If you, yeah, if you want to go and see what a, I think a muscle car looks like, it's uh, a Pontiac Super Duty Catalina mm-hmm. 421. So that's my uh, favorite one, uh, David. And uh, I wonder, how we'd go if we were if we were doing the standing quarter mile with your one. Mm, well, we'll find out in a second or two. Yeah. But it's appropriate you chose a Pontiac because yeah. really the whole thing started with the Pontiac GTO. Mm. And our good old friend, John DeLorean, claimed a lot of credit for that one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the GTO sold very well and, in fact, actually became known as the GOAT for some reason. Do you know why? Because I don't. Uh, well, greatest of all time, I would assume. Yeah. That. But that's, I guess it's a modern thing, though. Um, well, yeah, because... Yeah, I don't know. It's a strange one. Anyway, I'm going to go across Detroit to a different corporation for my choice. And this is an utterly ludicrous car in some ways. Mm. Uh, it's possibly the most extreme looking of all the muscle cars. It's a Plymouth Superbird. Um, that's a, it was a homologation special for NASCAR racing. It was based on the Plymouth Roadrunner. And yet the horn of the Roadrunner, indeed the Superbird, did go beep beep. Yeah. Um, you know, proving that people had a sense of humour back then. Uh, what you got for your money was a you know, fairly long two-door coupe with what appeared to be a tacked-on drip snoot and a comically high rear wing. And, yeah, you the top model, you could specify, it had a 7-litre engine uh, with an appropriate number of carburetors. I don't know the top speed, but I know it could do not to 16, about five and a half seconds, which, again, for 1970, James, is pretty mm. good going indeed. Um, it did race in NASCAR. Uh, Richard Petty, and NASCAR fans will still call him the king. Uh, he did win the title seven times. He raced it in 1970. Uh, it wasn't quite enough to take him to another championship. I think he won eight races. And sadly, it wasn't a commercial success either. Uh, many people preferred the, the planar uh, roadrunner um, to the Superbird. But if you see a Superbird, it's just a kind of car. This, it makes your day if you see one. You may not necessarily want to own one, but it's just such an outrageous looking car. You've got to love it. And it, probably for that reason, um, it still appeals very greatly today. That's the one I'd go for. Yeah, I think yeah, that I think the word overhang was invented for that, wasn't it? <laughs> I think a lot of words were invented. A lot of words were invented for, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it is an incredible car, that uh, the Superbird. Mm. Yeah. And there we have it. Such American muscle cars. So you can't really go wrong with them. I mean, if, if, you, if your taste is uh, a Mustang uh, fastback, um, the one that was in Bullet, the GT, uh, I think it was the 390, wasn't it? Yeah. And Highland Queen that McQueen drove. There's a replica kicks around, or used to kick around there in my hometown. Um, it was built to that sort of specification. That's a gorgeous car as well. 
um, even just a plain old Dodge Charger. There are so many great cars that you couldn't really go wrong. It's kind of like hot hatches from the 1980s. It wasn't a question of which is the best, really. It's a question of which one can you afford or which one most takes your fancy if you can afford any of them. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of it. And we're kind of deprived of that choice now, I feel. We are, yeah. I mean, we are talking about golden eras here, mm, uh, yeah. which uh, which are very unlikely to come back. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're not going to talk about electric cars, are we, Dave? So. No, no, no. I mean, no. Well, well, apart from the EV, that is, of course. Well, that's, a, that's a special case, isn't it? It's a special case, yes. Mm. It's uh, electrifying, well, an electric, mm. as some might say. We've done American muscle cars. We've done a few other different things. As usual, we, we dive around, do lots of daft things, get things wrong, uh, usually me. Uh, I'll take the blame for that. Before James blames me anyway, so yeah. <laughs> might as well. Um, we'll say thanks for listening again. I hope to catch you next week uh, when we'll be back with another dynamic episode of uh, Dempsey and Rupert. I mean, uh, Bangers and Classics. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm off um, uh, in that Clio that you spotted. Um, I want to track down uh, Nicole and see how she is. All right, say hello to Papa for me. I will do. Don't worry about that. Okay, cheerio. Yeah, bye, everybody. Bye.